Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. In lieu of a sponsorship this week, we're asking everyone to go and support Eric King. Eric just caught a 10-year sentence, and right now the support committee is offering t-shirts for a donation of $20 or more. So just go to supporteric.king.org, click on donate, donate at least $20 and you can get yourself an awesome Eric King sports shirt and all the money will go towards helping Eric King. I'm going to be getting my t-shirt today. So go get yours. Supporteric.king.org. This is episode 191. Yeah, we talk with Sam Martinez, the vegan anarchist. Sam has some pretty fucking cool YouTube videos. I I have a hard time getting into the YouTube scene. I'm just old, I guess. But when I start watching his videos, I just go down that YouTube hole that people talk about. I get sucked in. I fucking love it. I love it. So go check out his videos and uh, stay tuned for the conversation. So Jordan, what news do we have going on this week? For an event this week, we ask that you write a prisoner. Eric King could use some love right now. Also, Joseph Buddenberg could use a ton of love. We'll have all that information in the show notes. On June 26th in Spain, there was some animal liberation graffiti. And on June 29th in Czech Republic, eight hens were rescued. Way to go, Spain. In the Czech Republic. If you're going to be in Seattle on August 20th, you should head on over to the Seattle Anarchist Book Fair. And if you're going to be in Salt Lake City on September 10th, you should head on over to the Salt Lake City Veg Fest. Yeah, we'll be there with Vegan Warrior Princesses Attack. For the slingshot this week, July 3rd, 1982, Mumia Abul Jamal was convicted of shooting a cop. It was that fucking long ago. Yeah. It's insane. You know, like we talked about writing Nicole and everyone, you know, kick me a letter as well. Definitely. So, uh, yeah, that happened in history. It's fucked up history, man. But we pull these little tidbits of history out of the Slingshot Personal Organizer. Uh, go get your shit organized and get one. You can get one at a local info shop or an online info shop like AK Press. I sincerely hope you enjoy this episode. So, uh, how's your day going? Oh, my day's pretty. I just chilled because I just finished a week of classes I'm taking at, uni- at college. What are, you, what are you studying in college? I'm a sociology major. So, I wanted to do music originally, but music composition, but there wasn't really much jobs about it. I figured if I'd be a sociology, I could contribute some analysis, mm-hmm. you know. So you wanted to go into into music first, though. Um, yeah, I did. What 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 uh what drives you about music? You want to go to, like music reduction as far as like sound engineering kind of stuff. Composing. Like, oh, composing. Or- yeah. Yeah. Do you do you write music then? I take it. Yeah, I do. Do you do you have anything uh, online or do you, that you post with your channel? No, I haven't. I do have one that's online on my mom's channel because my mom's a country singer. Oh, and wow. And she did post that, yeah. But, but I wrote that like when I was in middle school like years ago. I haven't written anything for a while because I've been focusing on college and YouTube. Mm-hmm. But pretty soon I want to go back to it. Well, awesome. Mm-hmm. So do you do you write for a bunch of different instruments or like what's your favorite instrument? I write for uh, usually like orchestra, so I kind of write for huge numbers of instruments. But typically, I do like the strings a lot, and I also tend to like woodwinds. You know, I, I play the saxophone, 
and I was terrible at it, by the way. But I, <laughs> I, I can't even imagine the complexity of trying to write music for our orchestra. That just must be a, amazingly challenging. Yeah, well, I started off writing for like a trump because I I played the trumpet and I wrote it off just for trumpet parts, and then mm-hmm. over time I added more and more instruments as the like, time goes by. That was my instrument as well, a trumpet. Yeah, right now I'm learning the drums. Yeah, I I can't keep time enough, let alone the time between my hand and my feet. I can never keep time with both and have them not be synced <laughs> together. Yeah. Um, yeah, right now, um, I, my YouTube channel has been up for a little bit of over a year right now. And uh-huh. I kind of originally started cause I wanted to t- talk to vegans about anarchism and introduce anarchists to veganism and to recruit people into my side too. So <laughs> it's all about our re- side. Yeah. It's all about recruiting, right? Um, wh- wh- what, what really made you want to have that, that YouTube voice? Well, I was inspired originally I, because I became an anarchist because of libertarian socialist rants. Have you heard of them? Uh, just from watching your channel. Um, yeah, he he has like twenty over 20,000 subs and he originally got me into anarchism because I started off as a conservative when I was really young. I, I was, And then I became a, a right-wing libertarian. And then I gradually be, – and then once I found – I start questioning my my beliefs because I realize that corporate tyranny is awful. So I found libertarian socialist rants and transitioned to anarchism. Did you uh, make a step through ANCAP? I know a lot of people that are that libertarianism make a step going through ANCAP before becoming a real anarchist. I did for a brief period of time, but then I think I went back to normal libertarian. So, so. what what was the draw of like? Um, just because I've never understood the draw of like ANCAP or libertarianism. What's really the draw behind that? Well, what drew me to it because is because I didn't want the government to regulate me. But then once I, but then once I study some of it and I hear other voices like Abby Martin, she's not a libertarian, but, she, but she's really influential. I start realizing that corporations and companies tend to be tyrannical just like the government. So I had to find something else and I couldn't go to Soviet Stalinism because that's tyrannical. So I, I found libertarian socialist rants. And then, uh, so w- w- what about anarchism really drew you into it? And, and uh, on top of that, do you find yourself like going towards a certain sect of anarchism, like, you know, anarcho syndicalists or something like that? Well, I'm, I'm kind of a green anarchist and an ANCOM, an anarcho communist. Mm-hmm. For a time I was mu- interested in mutualism, but then I, I, but I really, but I kind of like thought about it, and I realized that markets have externalities, and markets are not an ideal way of running society, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So I, so I do anarcho communism combined with like green anarchism. What when you say green anarchism, do you uh, referring more to like deep ecology, or are you referring more to like primitivism? Because I I know people kind of equate to both. Um, I I kind of I'm more of a social ecologist. Um, I do, I, I, I do, I don't like the idea of civilization, but I don't believe in abolishing technology. I think that we need technology and that it's a good thing we have technology. Uh, and by, cool. yeah, by civilization, I mean like large cities that, that happened like thousands of years ago to nowadays. Yeah, I think you just described mm-hmm. where I have found mm-hmm. myself kind of sitting in that happy medium. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I s- I still tend to go to anarcho syndicalism a lot, though more than anarcho communism. But I view syndicalism uh, a- and mutualism more of like stepping stones, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe not ideal, but work in progress kind of things. Yeah, um, I do. I I understand those anarcho syndicalists, but I feel like anarchists are not as anarchist principles work a lot better in smaller organizations, typically. Mm-hmm. I like the idea of syndicalism as a way of organizing workers to make the transition from the current working class to something different. That's kind of what I think, too. Yeah. Uh, part of me also likes insurrectionary anarchism. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we all do, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so 
one of the things that, that, that we always do when we have a guest on and we, we like to try to, you know, do a little bit of research. And usually when we have somebody on that has YouTube videos, I'll watch one or two and then, you know, be like, okay, I'm good. But I found myself glued to your channel. I fucking loved it. Um, really? I, yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely loved it. Uh, I would say I watched probably three, three fourths of it so far. Uh, so a good majority of it. Um, so I, I don't I don't know what I was going with that. Just I really loved it. So thank you. Uh, I, I wish people could really would really, you know, give give it a chance. Um, have you found it hard to get a voice inside the crowded YouTube uh, blogosphere? Well, yeah, I kind of I kind of want to share my voice. And it's a good thing because in the vegan community, um, the biggest problem is, is we have a lot of popular vegans who say reactionary stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. Like Vegan Gain saying that he that basically he wants to stomp on babies or like people talk, ba like or really basically advocating for like population control, basically almost eugenic like in his language. How much of that is just the the idea of clickbait for the YouTube, um, how they monetize on YouTube videos? So they just say outlandish things to to force people to watch their videos. Um, part of me, I think that has a lot to do with it, actually. So yeah, yeah. How, yeah. how how do you how do you they combat that? Like, how do you find a voice inside that chaos? Well, I just, I just. I used to make videos about how uh, what I don't like about freely. I did make a few videos about freely and during Rider. Uh -huh. But what what the channel that influenced me was a privileged vegan. She's not an anarchist, but she kind of had an influence on me. And so did the black vegans. Like um, black vegans rock. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, so what was your origin becoming vegan? Like what what was your your turning point? Well, ironically, it was I, I used to saw freely the banana girl, but now when she was like fashion, I, I was more drawn to like the health aspect, and then I saw like, oh look, look how bad the egg industry is, babies, chicks being ground alive. So what turned me on was those videos combined with health. But the reason I stayed vegan is because the environmental and because I actually care about the animals. Mm -hmm. I've I've heard a lot of people um, have freely be one of those uh, stepping stones, but usually mm -hmm. it seems like once they you know are familiar with her, they kind of move away from more of our rhetoric. I think the same would be said of like Gary, um, like Francion. No, Francion, I was gonna say Yervoski as well. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And same thing with me. Um, I did find it, Gary Yervoski's speech about Palestinians. Um, I when I once I heard that I kind of like stay away from him, especially as misanthropy. You know, yeah. I I never listened to the speech just because I was already really uh, disenfranchised with him long before then. Uh, what what was really said? I've only heard like bits and pieces from people. Well, basically, he was saying that Palestinians are psychotic, that and the blacks are hypocrites, and the. Um, but he's a misanthrope, not a racist, and like, what the f <laughs> yeah, he actually he actually says he's a misanthrope. Although he does claim to love his wife, which would contradict that. He even says he hates vegans, a lot of vegans. So, like, being a misanthrope, like, what's the difference between being a nihilist and if you really are that, why would you even want to exist? Well, I'm not a nihilist, so because I. So I wouldn't know because I, when I do have nihilism mindsets, I kind of feel sad. So I kind of stay away from nihilism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just I don't get either one of those mindsets personally. Yeah, it's not really productive. I mean, you're more helpful for any reason. Yeah. So one of the questions that, that I had coming, coming like uh, watching your YouTube channel was. You you talk about having Asperger's yourself, and then I loved your video you did on uh, neurodiversity. But do yeah, you, I find it interesting um, that the YouTube sphere seems to be the most hate-filled sphere on the internet. Um, so how have they been towards you? Well, th most of the time they've been usually nice, except for my Bernie Sanders video. <laughs> and I they insulted me for having autism. That's Really? 
Yeah, like, like, and so when they talk about Bernie Bros, I, I kind of believe them, even though TYT says there isn't a such a thing. And I've heard from other, like, YouTube pages that similar things happen to them. So with with, with your Bernie video, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because I, I watched it uh, as well. And I found some of it uh, hard to swallow, to be honest with you. Um, and All I'm right. not, I'm not a huge, uh, Bernie fan just because, you know, I'm an anarchist and he's not right. But he's a uh, social Democrat. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I wouldn't even know if you could really label him that I know he labels himself, but, um, but I, there was a couple things in there that, that I, I, I didn't know like where you got the, the, the facts on, like when you, you stated that he was for continuing the war in Iraq and things like that. Um, I always thought well, he I was, was saying that he was, but I, he's voted against the war, but he voted to fund the war. So in a way he, he just, he supported the war just because he voted to fund it. Okay. I mean, I, I could, okay. I see that. Um, so what what challenges did you really find with uh with posting that video? Oh man, when I posted I just got like a a shitstorm of hate comments. How, how do you handle the hate comments and, and uh what was some what were what, what were some of them? One of them is like are you from Flint because you should stop drinking that water you autistic fuck? Oh my god. That one isn't on there anymore because I think I reported that one. But there's other ones like one of them is pretty sexual. And then the other one, yeah, just things like that. It's just that those are the comments. And the other one was like Democrat socialist, not socialist. And to be fair, he's a social Democrat, not Democrat socialist. But yeah, there was a lot, and a lot of thumbs down. How do you, how do you deal with that criticism and those and those like the hateful comments and stuff like that? Well, at first it was pretty hard on me. I I kind of tried to avoid YouTube for a little bit, and then but then I kind of realized that that I'm getting a lot of views off of it, so it's going to help me anyways. And I kind of over over time learned to brush it off. You know, if you if you're not getting you know uh, criticism, then then people aren't listening, right? That's how the internet is now. Yeah, mm -hmm. and also I I was part of a group. Uh, well, I'm still part of it. Is it a leftist group on my Facebook? And when I posted that, it was a shitstorm. Like every word is Bernie <laughs> Sanders support. It was a shitstorm. <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> so, so, oh, let's get sorry, Jordan. Do do you find that? It's kind of ironic to me that many leftists are Bernie Sanders supporters when it doesn't really fit in with their ideologies 100%, but I guess it's the best thing that they have now. It's kind of sad, yeah. But should we build alternatives? Because that's kind of our jobs. I don't know why anarchists aren't doing that. No, I, I, that's a fair point. I think that, that that's a, a, a totally fair point. Um but I, I find myself like in, in a weird conundrum where I'm like, yes, we should be building alternatives, but <clears throat> you know, what's going to be the best for society in the next short term while we're trying to build alternatives, right? Do we take the the privilege that we have and say, you know, fuck it and, and not, you know, utilize that privilege in, in spite of everyone else um, that and have that possibly harm people at the same time? Well, uh, I kind of grappled with that question. Ironically, after I said not to vote for Bernie Sanders, I wanted to vote for Vermin Supreme because he was a joke <laughs> candidate. But he was on the ballot, and the only be the best one was Bernie Sanders. And I pulled my nose and voted for him. <laughs> so, so, so you, you you posted that video, and then you ended up voting for him? Yeah. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I, I think that that encapsulates the internal struggle of every anarchist that I know. Right there, <laughs> I, I was right there too. <laughs> yep. I love I love it. So, uh, are you going to vote in the general election? Hell no. Really. Well, it's because uh, it's ch like choosing between Mussolini and Nixon. I mean, if you can have evil, why even bother? I mean, personally, if I had to choose between Mussolini and Nixon, it's a clear choice of Nixon, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And, and I agree. I think it is like a choice like that where, you know, you have a fucked up candidate and then you have a fucked up authoritarian, mm-hmm. like bullshit candidate that is racist and homophobic and hates people and wants to kill people. So, yeah. Well, my thing is, is I marched it, pointed out, and the anarchists generally agree with this, this idea that the the state is an instrument of the ruling class. So in mm-hmm. a way, if you vote for this, does anybody for the government f- office, you're choosing who, who's going to serve the ruling class's interests against yours. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I agree with that. I totally agree that it is, it is for the ruling class. Um, but who's going to be the worst for the non-ruling class, right? Who's going to be the worst for people of color or uh, disenfranchised people? I'll probably say Trump. So then I'm going to say in the short term where I'm trying to eliminate, why not have the slightly better of the worst? I could never justify voting for Hillary, though. Um, I, yeah. I, it's, not, it's not to me. See, this is the, the, my, my internal struggle. So I'm just voicing my internal struggle out 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 loud right now, right? Where I yeah. I don't feel that uh that any vote that i would cast this election as a vote for somebody i can only vote against people right so i think a, a an active vote against trump with something better than a vote for anybody well if you're gonna vote just vote for like a socialist party not like leninist those people are like i would never vote for a leninist but like vote for a democrat socialist like a legit or vote green party if you want to go that route yeah like jill stein yeah, you know, I would every every election my entire life. I've always argued with people that they should vote their conscience, right? And, and you shouldn't worry about uh, whether or not that vote's actually going to matter in the long term, right? Vote your conscience. That's what the whole thing is for. And you need to uh, vote your dissent, basically. Uh, and this is the first time that I'm grappling with not doing that. Yeah, I know. I feel the same way, but part. I just realized that. I'm in a red state and my state is going to vote the same way regardless when I vote. I'm not going to make a difference. And why would I support a system like even even I'm well, it's not giving a legitimacy, you're giving it the illusion of legitimate legitimacy. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to give the state that legitimacy. That's fair. Yeah. And I feel like if nobody votes, they can't turn around and say that's the will of the people because they're not going to have any bag, they're going to have any votes to show that they have the mandate. The you know, mandate. I'm in I'm in a red state as well, but this is probably the first one of the first times in my history that uh, the polling here has indicated that it might not be um, this election. Looking purple. Yeah. Interesting. I'm from Texas. My the part of Texas is South Texas, and that's more of a blue area. But the rest of Texas is red, except for Austin and my area. Hmm. So uh, to switch switch gears a little bit here, um, would you mind? Like we 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 brought up the video you did on uh, neurodiversity. Would you mind going into that a little bit more? Because I thought it was very important for people to hear it, and not really talked about inside the vegan movement. Well, yeah, because one of the reasons I made that is because PETA released an ad saying that dairy causes autism without any evidence. And what kind of I feel like using autism as as a as a way to promote veganism is inherently ableist. And I and I kind of don't want anything to do with that. So as an, so I, I feel like that we shouldn't use like, oh, this person, it's like the same tactics that Autism Speaks uses. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is something that was new to me that was only brought up recently that I was made aware of. Would, would you mind going to that a little bit as well of, of what, you, what that whole um, aspect of, of the autism activism is, is? Well, I've been on a few interviews. I don't really, I should probably do more about it, but I've done a few interviews. But basically, I'm more in the camp of autism rights, neurodiversity, because there are some who want to cure, and I don't want to be cured. And then it's a, it's a, there's a lot of politics going on. And um, but what I've found is that on YouTube, there are a lot of people on the edges of the spectrum who are autistic. Mm-hmm. Like from ANCABs to MRAs to even anarchists. So is that... Is, um... Are, do you speak out against like ABA and stuff like that? 
What's his ABA? ABA or Applied Behavioral Analysis Therapy. I'm not really familiar. So I, I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. It's, uh, I have a lot of friends that um, are into like autism activism. And, um, and that's one of the things they speak out about. The, yeah, one of yeah. the things they speak out about. It's pretty much you're abusing children in order oh. to get them to be quote unquote normal. Oh, yeah. Um, you, I have, I take med, meds and like medication just be, cause so I can focus and things like that. And without it, people kind of don't want to be around me. I kind of have that kind of thing. What, what I really liked about your, the, the video that when you went into neurodiversity was, uh, talking about the idea that, that it's okay for people to be different. And, and you equated it with the vegan movement where, um, people tend to, uh, fat shame in the vegan movement uh i unfortunately was yeah. one of them when i was younger mm-hmm. um and, and this played like really heavily into it yeah yeah it's very common i mean um all um, the big youtubers do it all the time from vegan gains have done a lot of fat shaming to freely they build like their entire careers on channels on that and i find that re- disgusting honestly so when when you went vegan, um, how did your family react to that? Well, I kind of transitioned over time. The original hurdle was that I don't know how to cook, but my and my fam, my mom didn't like the fact that she had to cook like three separate meals at once: one for me, one for my brother, and one for her. But eventually, though, I um, she just does anyways. I I don't know how to cook, and that's my problem right now. Mm-hmm. I did like your video on uh, making tamales. Yeah, that was the earlier one. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was, I'm from I'm because my my dad's side of family are from Mexico, so I have a Latino culture or Mexican culture, and then my mom's side is, is Anglo from Minnesota, so I kind of grew up in an almost bicultural environment in an area that's mostly Mexican. So I, I noticed that you used the term Latin X, and that was actually something I wasn't quite familiar with. Yeah, it was a new term for me. And that's a, is that just that's a general neutral term, correct? Yeah, I use it because I kind of wanted to be gender neutral in that one. I really like that. I, I feel that's one of the aspects in the English language that that we are very poor on uh, pronoun utilization and having general neutral pronouns. We're very, but we're a lot better than like Spanish. We have gender signifier almost every word they use. Mm-hmm. How how does that play out? Not I'm, I'm since I don't speak Spanish. I know Jordan speaks Spanish, but um. I don't I don't speak Spanish either. My dad does, but I kind of when I was when, when I was going to to school at the young age I was at I didn't I had to go to speech therapy so they taught me English because they figured that I would have problems learning two languages at once. At the time I was nonverbal. Mm-hmm. So so with coming into veganism and anarchism, how how is your family with your YouTube channel? Um, and was there like a lot of support behind that? There is some, and then there are sometimes I made videos that kind of raise a few eyebrows. <laughs> what what videos raise raise the most eyebrows? Well, the one about getting rid of civilization. And then a lot of people keep thinking I'm a primitivist, so I have to like clarify I'm not advocating for being hunter gatherer. I'm advocating to be like a gardening society, not a hunter gatherer. So, so more or less, we're just providing for each other food from our own gardens, kind of thing. Yeah, and permaculture. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I love the idea of it, but I also worry that. Um, that is also very uh, a privileged uh, aspect of living, especially with the urban density cultures that we have, and where, yeah. where would the people that are currently in that 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 form of that urban density uh, be able to grow their own food, considering uh, land usage problems? That is a problem, but there are vegans and, and anarchists who are trying to help the. There are projects to help the inner cities grow food. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's where like the problems like food deserts and stuff come into this. Yeah. Um, it's 
it's the an issue that I've had with the whole uh, eat local idea uh, that everyone should eat local when the vast majority of people, especially in urban environments, are unable to eat lo- local. One, because things aren't grown locally, they might not have food available locally, or they might not have funds available to get enough caloric intake locally. And then, and then a lot of people don't have time for gardens, so typically mm-hmm. they have to like make everybody only has a certain amount of time, so you make sure that you spread it out so people don't have to use as much time at once. But it, that is pretty privileged, yeah. But I feel like once we're able to like eat away at capitalism over time, it won't matter as much. Yeah, I mean, I guess that that's the the end goal, right? Mm-hmm. It is to help build up those institutions to replace the current market institutions that we have, right? Yeah, that is the end goal. So, um, listening to your videos, it it sounds like you like just devour classic uh, anarchist literature. Is that an accurate statement? Well, I kind of well, honestly, I don't really read very much classical anarchists. I've read a few like Lysander Spooner's No Trees, and I've I've listened to most of the, like Emma Goldman, but I haven't finished most of the books I was supposed to read. Oh, okay, I'm right but there yeah. too. I, I I don't read my classical anarchism, and I get a lot of criticism. Well, it. I, I mean. I, to be fair, like when you talk about like the the elimination of markets and you talk about mutualism, you talk about like deep ecology, um, it, it you can tell you really know your shit, right? Uh, and that's why, oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, because I I read articles about it. I I kind of read like news articles. Sometimes I go to like C four says and listen to the podcast. C four says is state Center for Stateless Society, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so I I've so I kind of. I, I may not read the classical anarchist books a lot, but I do read the writings that the modern day proponents espouse. You know, so that's where I fall. I I fall more on the classical side than the modern day side. So, what what would you recommend as far as like modern day leanings or or the modern day philosophers for anarchism? Well, there was a nineteenth century anarchist who advocated for vegetarianism and animal liberation, but I don't know how to pronounce his name. But he was, but there was an actual. He was from France. Elise Recuse. I don't know how to pronounce French. That sounds familiar. Recuse or something. I'm. Yeah. Not, yeah. I'm not. I'll, I'll look it up. We'll post it in the show notes. I'm not familiar with that. Mm-hmm. But he, yeah, he did, and he basically talked against slaughterhouses. So if I was you, I'd probably read him. Although I'm pretty sure he's probably forgotten by now. <laughs> it's, it's just so sad how that that works, right? Yeah, well, people for the most part only remember Bakunin, Emma Goldman, and Peter Kropak, and they don't remember very much others. Yeah, I mean, those are the biggies, right? Yeah. I mean, there are a few Max Sternerites, but they're not very widely known. Yeah. I mean, it almost makes a a case for nihilism. How so? How so? Because none of us are ever remembered. Oh, yeah. And um, I kind of well, looked into uh, egoism for a little bit, but I kind of don't know how am I going to be able to mix it with animal liberation because animal liberation does have a moral case to make. So I kind of, kind of have, kind of like, st- I'm a little uneasy with it. I'm not. I'm not familiar with egoism. Can you uh, explain that to me a little bit? Well, the more problem I'm having is the idea that morality is a spook. I'm not very familiar with it, but from what I can tell, I, I'm not very, I don't know about that. So morality is a spook, like morality doesn't exist? Well, he's almost, he basically often goes to almost near moral nihilism. Yeah, okay. it kind of sounds nihilistic. Um, yeah. Are you a religious person? I used to be. But um, no, I'm not. Um, I was a, a neo pagan. I'm not even familiar with that. Well, you know, you ever heard of Starhawk? Nope. Uh, well, pagan. They base like I used to be in like the old, the old spiritualities that are based off of Europe, European spirituality. Okay. But nowadays, it's mostly been co opted by like the far right. Although there are some anarchists and other radicals who are fighting back 
I, I mean, I do know some of the um, original roots of anarchism in America did did start out with a lot of uh, religious uh, leanings, especially coming from like Mennonites and things like that. Well, yeah, the Quaker, well, uh-huh. not a, yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah. So, do you did you find um, a lot of reference from that in your in your path to anarchism? Well, not very much until I read Temporary Autonomous Zones. I, you, you, you are so m- more well read than I am. It's it's a joke. I'm, I'm not even familiar with that either. <laughs> it's well, basically, is you know what t- autonomous zone is is a space that for that that isn't governed by the laws of capitalism or the state, and a temporary autonomous zone is this area that's temporarily abandoned, and for temporarily you can go to it and do your thing and have fun, and then. Once the state comes, you leave before they find you. Kind of like pirates used to do. That sounds cool. It does. Yeah. <laughs> it does sound cool. But unfortunately, when I talked about it, I got called a lifestyleist. Um, as far as? Well, because the author who wrote that was criticized by Bookchins and life, as a lifestyleist anarchist. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well... Don't you kind of think that anti-capitalism in general is the answer for veganism and animal rights and everything else? Yeah, that's what I was trying to communicate. I was trying to say that, look, um, your attempts at animal rights is futile if you if capitalism destroys the environment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm trying to – but a lot of vegans don't – I'm in trouble getting to them. That's my challenge I've been having. What what uh just them understanding the connection between capitalism and animal liberation? Yeah, that's the problem I'm trying to com- yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah, what I, I have a really hard time uh with the lifestyle vegans compared to ethical vegans, um personally. And it, it it's not a hard time as like uh I think they should die or anything. It's mm-hmm. just um I it's a struggle of like, why can't you see the connection, you know? I even have a hard time with ethical vegans. It's, it's some. Just, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many different types of vegans that it's it's just hard to get along with everyone. Well, we can get along with vegan anarchists because that's what we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is very true. <laughs> so, uh, what 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 is the is there anything inside either the the vegan movement or the the animal rights movement that you see happening a lot that you just wish wouldn't be happening basically well freely enduring writer i also feel like a lot of animal rights activists are misanthropic i don't like the fact that a lot of them tends to not care about human rights and focus Mm -hmm. only on the animals when i see it as a total struggle between humans animals and the environment you know the uh one of the things that i noticed in one of your earlier videos um, and it's something that I don't hear very many animal rights activists acknowledge, and you did, so I want to like acknowledge you for it. Is that you? You mentioned the idea of you know whether or not you're going to save a uh, a dog or a baby, and you're like you know ideally I would save both, but I had to choose. I'm going to choose the baby, and that's the one way I've always been myself too. Like if yeah, if, and I've never understood why animal rights activists really have a hard time acknowledging that what you know instead of just saying yeah we should be able to save both and why can't we save both but if you really had that decision yeah i would save the baby but we mm-hmm. get a lot of shit for being quote unquote specious for that mentality well yeah um yeah it's like asking if you have a black and a white person which one you would save it's kind of like that kind of yeah my my reason is because you can relate to a human baby better than an animal, and you and you you could communicate when it when it grows up. It's more it's it comes across as easier to talk to. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But I wouldn't know how to answer the "Would you choose a black or a white baby?" because I don't think. It would make a difference to me. It doesn't make it. Yeah. That to me, they're a little different where an animal and a baby does. So I guess I mean, I guess I am a species. No, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) yeah. I mean, definitely a species in that regard. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. I'm a species is when it comes to mosquitoes. (laughs) (laughs) They're assholes and they need to die. (laughs) 
<laughs> They're like the one animal I don't feel sorry killing. <laughs> And and from what I understand, there's actually um, there are some vegans that are helping with campaigns to eliminate mosquitoes by releasing only um, only males into the population or something. The remember. sterile males, yeah, sterile yeah. males into the population. So yeah. that I haven't heard about that one. There is a huge debate because there's some uh, vegan advocates who are pro, pro GMO and some that are anti GMO. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, what side of the fence are you yeah, on? Yeah, since you brought it up, where, do, where where are you on that? Well, personally, I don't mind GMO per se. My problem is 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 used by corporations like Monsanto to basically monopolize the food industries and it's, and exploit profits out of people. Right. So, <laughs> like, you just keep like saying exactly how I feel. Like, uh, I'm not against eating GMO food, but I'm against the the corporate infrastructure that that they utilize and uh, create food scarcity for certain areas. And intellectual property also plays into that. Yeah, the idea of being able to have uh, patents over a gene is fucking ridiculous, right? Yeah, because my thing is that I feel like the whole GMO thing is good because I can genetically modify pistachios at B12. Yeah, and. And so it help a lot of with our B twelve issues as vegans. I never even thought about that. I My mean, thing is though is that if you take a, a frog gene out of a tom- of, out of a frog and you put it in a tomato plant, it's not technically vegan. Yeah, from my understanding, that whole like fish in a tomato thing is kind of one of those myth areas. They say it's possible, but it never really happened, from my understanding of it. I, to be honest, I from what I read, they usually do it to be to be able to resist Roundup, which is basically destroying the environment as we speak. And Roundup is this herbicide that people spray in their lawns and mm-hmm. farmers use. It's mm-hmm. really toxic, and they found it like almost ninety something percent of all adults have it. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Mm-hmm. Not at all. And I, I, I was watching a little uh, thirty-minute clip about Monsanto. By uh, are you familiar with the Abby Martin? No, I'm not. Well, she she has a show called Breaking the Set, and one time she had Crime Think on it, but that was one time. Well, she has a new show called Empire Flies, where she talks about the American Empire, and mm-hmm. she dedicated an entire episode to Monsanto. Hmm. Hmm. Was it was it pretty good uh, as far as uh, talking about the corporate aspect of things? Oh, she uh, whatever she does is great. I mean, I don't know how she does it, but she does it pretty well. I think my biggest problem is just the misinformation, the scare tactics when it comes to GMOs. Yeah, I feel like that too. Um, I, I don't like the idea of corporations in control of my food supply. That's my bottom line with it. Yeah. I'd rather, of, yeah. That's kind of where I am. I, I was just thinking on, in the terms of, um, like, in the same lines as, like, milk causes autism. I've heard, you know, GMOs cause autism. Vaccines cause autism. Mm-hmm. Like, that kind of thing, which is just... It's just anti-science able, yeah. scare tactics, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, my thing about unnatural vegans is that she, I do, I do, I do feel like that some of her stances might be could easily invite corporations to co-opt her message. Because especially, especially when she talks about GMOs, I feel like she I, doesn't she doesn't acknowledge the fact that corporations are trying to seize control of our food supply. I mean, they pretty much have control over food supply, right? I wouldn't say well, they're trying. They yeah. Well, they do, yeah. That's why we should get heirloom seeds and garden with them. So what kind of programs would you, would you say would be best for building up the institution of, like you said, um, providing food for yourself and your community? Well, permaculture. That's what I would do. Veganic permaculture. 
you work with nature and you find wherever you can, any land. You, if you don't have any good soil, you use raised beds and put some compost in there, some rock dust, and then you basically plant and you water and you take care of it and then you get food. Um, you, you feature your garden in quite a few of your videos. What's your favorite part of gardening? Well, I've done some most of my plants have didn't make the storm that that happened, but I do I am growing sugarcane. But my favorite part is that when I I take care of the seed and then I get like a return out of it. So you kind of like an kind of like an investment basically, but without you know playing with money. Mm -hmm. So you grow sugarcane. Well, Rymat, it's uh, subtropical, and they grow sugarcane around Rymat all the time. So how would how do you harvest sugarcane? I'm not familiar yeah, with like, it. Yeah, like what do much. you do with it besides just chewing on it? That's the only thing I can yeah, I know that's that you the only do thing to I've it. done. Well, right now I haven't the harvest is still growing, but there are there are like ju sugarcane juices you could get some of them hand crank, some of them electric that would convert the sugarcane into into a liquid. That you can use to as a sweetener, and what they usually do is they refine it further by boiling the water to get like sh sugar, powdered sugar. But usually, you, when you do it, you get liquid sugar. That's amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. Usually, they burn it though. But that, from what I've heard, I haven't looked into it. It's not very environmentally friendly. Because okay. um, that's how they get molasses, right? Yeah, oh, I'm not sure how to get molasses, but that could be part of it, yeah. I know it's something to do with harvesting sugarcane, that's all I know. Because I learned about it because I was watching this episode called of Growing Your Greens, mm -hmm. and, I, and I saw this guy growing sugarcane in South Florida, and he had a hand crank wheel that he just put sugarcane, he cranks it, and then basically sweet liquids came out. That's pretty awesome. It's probably just like a, a cold okay. press, right? Um, yeah yeah um i i love getting back to that that whole diy aspect of doing things right um i try to do that with, with everything i'm doing i just uh ordered seeds so i can grow, grow my own um east india bay tree so i can make my own bay rum aftershave yeah <laughs> Oh, I, right now I kind of don't really have much time to maintain it because I'm in a living situation where I'm with my mom part of the week and my dad for the other part of the week. Mm -hmm. So I kind of moved back between two houses, so I don't really have time to take care of them. But the plants that I that I planted aloe vera and that plant have gotten really huge. And I don't even take care of it. I just let it be. It's just gross. I don't live in a climate like that, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Because I live in a subtropical, but it's semi-arid. So if it can handle a lot of heat and dry climates, it should be able to do well here. We have to worry about well, the I'm frost not. here. Yeah, we have lots of frost, so we have a very short growing season. I'm, I'm right, right next to Mexico, actually. So I'm like South Texas. So do, you, do you, your friends and family... Uh, watch your youtube channel and ever get mad at you about what you post on there well they sometimes they watch it um usually it's i usually get a lot of support and then but there are a few videos like the civilization one or the one where i talked about liking big girls that kind of raised a few eyebrows it, i i told my parents when we started doing this show just don't listen you'll <laughs> you'll be upset <laughs> Yeah, my I usually try not to talk about with my dad because he's a petty. What you call a petty bourgeois? <laughs> so I usually don't keep. I usually don't like talking about it, but it comes out. <laughs> I love that you just called your dad a petty bourgeois. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that just that honestly just made my night. By the way, <laughs> yeah, it didn't stop my parents from listening recently, though. Oh yeah, they did, didn't uh -huh. they? Yep. Um, and what else would you? What else would you? Any other questions for me? So no. Um, how can people, you know, get get uh, a hold of you and, and see see the work that you're doing? 
Oh, for like the music or for the videos? For like the videos and, and stuff, yeah. Oh, did you just go on YouTube and watch me? And just type up the vegan anarchist and my channel is the first thing that pops up. Well, awesome. Uh, we'll put a link to that in our show as well. And um, we, we, you end your show a certain way every single week and we do it a little bit differently. But will you uh, end it the way that you normally do end your videos this week? Right now? Yeah. This is the vegan anarchist. No meat, no milk, no master seal. This week you heard... Brighton Beach 420 by Beardy Man. Right now you're listening to Recovery by Rival Consoles. You know how uh, every week we ask people to go rate and review us? Yeah. You know, I just wanted to give a, a huge thank you to Luke DeProst, who gave us this quite flattering review on iTunes titled The Best Podcast Around. It says, Attention all meat eaters that have stumbled across this podcast. You absolutely must listen to Which Side Podcast. It is an awesome podcast that will bring you hours of enjoyment listening to Jordan and Jeremy along with their wide variety of guests. If I haven't convinced you to give Which Side a listen yet, then let me speak to you in the only language you apparently know. Bacon, 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 bacon. You absolutely will not regret listening to this podcast. FSD. Thanks, Luke. That could go for some bacon right now. Vegan, of course. Oh, of course. Yeah, of course. I just assumed Yeah, I mean, that's well, what he was talking about, right? Well, why wouldn't he be talking about that? Because vegan bacon is the shit. I love it. What's your favorite? Have you tried the rice paper bacon yet? No, I had that's, not. It's a new thing that people are doing. Newfangled thing. It's the next aquafaba, I think. Uh, so something that's too complicated for me to do? It's not complicated. God, I don't get that sciency kitchen stuff. Looks delicious. <laughs> So go, please, write a review. Go rate and review us. It helps us show out tremendously. Uh, it just we we need we need the help. It makes it so people can find us. So help us out. And if you don't want to do that, then hit up your friends on social media. And while you're doing that, become our friend. Yeah. That's easy to do. All you have to do is hit that little like button or the follow button or whatever equivalent button there is for the social media platform that you use my friends give me high fives and hugs so i mean i should start a social media thing that will fail because everything's conquered by facebook that is high fives and hugs yeah it'll get bought out maybe i'm done i want the physical hugs and high fives so friend us on a social media platform and uh when we actually meet in real life we'll become real friends because we'll give you a high five or a hug if you want that contact, of course, we're going to make sure that it's consensual contact. I could always like make robots that give hugs and then you click like the hug button and then it comes and hugs you. Is that too complicated? No. I think it's the, it. I think it's the next thing. Yeah. Technology. Fuck shit down. <laughs> <laughs> Foreshadowing again, once again. Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective, with web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Theme music by Commandantes. Go to whichsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, fuck shit damn. <laughs>